Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unusor Education. We continue talking about vector fields. Uh, we have already covered um, gradient of scalar field, which produces the vector field of gradients. Um, we have also covered divergence. Today we will talk about the characteristic which is called circulation of vector field. Well, obviously you understand that circulation somehow related to circular um, character of, of the vector field. Um, like a tornado, for example, if our vector field is three-dimensional velocities of each molecule of, um, of the air, just as an example. Anyway, this uh, lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens. That's the wave part of this course, and in particular part of the topic field waves, because we are gradually moving to the waves um, of, of the fields. But we have to know the characteristics of fields, including the circulation, for example. Now, it's presented on the website called unizor.com. Um, the site contains also a prerequisite course which is called Mass Routines. Um, I do recommend you to go through material presented in the Mass because we definitely use a lot of Mass um, in the physics course. Definitely calculus, definitely vector algebra, um, matrices sometimes. Uh, now the uh, the course contains basically uh, video recorded lectures like this one which you're looking at and um, every lecture has a textual complement, supplement. Um, it's basically like a textbook. So every lecture has a like a chapter of the textbook which is related to that particular material. There are some problems solved. There are exams. Um, the site is completely free. There are no advertisement, no strings attached. You don't even have to sign in if you don't want to. Um, exams, you can take exams as many times as you want until your score is 100%, basically. All right, so let's return to circulation. First of all, I would like to talk about circulation in two-dimensional case because uh, subsequent lectures will cover two-dimensional curl of the vector field, which is basically a subsequent topic after the circulation, and then three-dimensional, which basically is reduced to three two-dimensional cases. So one three-dimensional is three two-dimensional cases. Basically, that's how I approach this. So today we'll be talking about two-dimensional um, vector fields, which means that every um, point on the plane has a vector coming from it into some direction of some magnitude. That's what basically vector field is. Um, so obviously this vector at point x, y, this is a vector. So at every combination of x, y, which are coordinates on the Cartesian plane, we have a vector which has certain direction and certain magnitude. And obviously this vector has projections on x-axis and on y-axis. So the vector has two components, obviously. So this is x component, projection turned to x, and this is y component, projection on the y. Okay, now we are assuming that the vector field is not changing with the time right now. So it's a stationary vector field. I mean, all the vectors can be either the same, maybe, or different, or whatever, but they're not changing with the time. Now, now we would like to introduce a concept of time but not to the changing of the vector field, but to the movement within this vector field. So let's assume that there is a steady wind which is blowing into some directions, not necessarily in one direction. Um, maybe there is some kind of a uh, small whirlpool or, or whatever, it doesn't really matter. 
but it's there and let's assume that we have a mm, surface of the lake with mm, paper ships on it or some particles whatever and uh, the wind is blowing and we would like actually to move our paper ship from one place to another along certain paths and I'm interested in work which I'm supposed to do now if I'm working against the wind so I'm having certain I have to exert certain effort to go against the wind now the wind is known there is F this is basically the force of the wind which I have to overcome and I know my trajectory so in theory I can calculate the work which I'm supposed to do if on the other hand I'm moving with the wind um, then there is also work but it's kind of negative so the work in this particular case uh, becomes positive or negative depending on whether I'm going against the wind or the wind helps me how can I calculate this amount of work to basically make some kind of a judgment about well which way to which path to take from A to B okay. so, um, we will consider three different cases of what kind of a wind actually we have, what kind of a vector field we have. And um, the first and very simple um, uh, situation is when the wind goes straight along one line, so all these vectors are equal in both direction and magnitude. And uh, my path, my trajectory is a straight line. So, I'm moving from A to B, and the wind goes this way. Doesn't matter actually where, as long as we are considering the case when all these vectors are exactly the same. Same direction, same magnitude. And I'm moving along the straight line. Well, let me just start from a simpler case. What if my moving from A to B exactly opposite to the wind, exactly opposite to the force. Well then, I have to exhort efforts. My force is supposed to be basically compensate. It's supposed to compensate the force against which I'm going. So I have to um, exhort uh, force the same F as the wind. These are all F. and I have to cover the distance from A to B and the work is basically force times the distance we all know that, right? now, if my path is not parallel to direction there is a slight modification to this cosine of alpha, cosine of angle Why? Because, well, if in this particular case my force goes this way, um, my, the, the force can also can, can, can be represented uh, like perpendicular to my path and parallel to my path, right? So these are two components. Now, the components which is perpendicular to my path doesn't really um, resist my movement, but this component, which is exactly opposite, it does. So, I have to really take only this component into consideration. Uh, and this component is uh, equal to, if I will take the um, uh, vector f, and I will take the vector a b from a to b the way how i'm moving actually then their scalar product would be exactly the multiplication of this force the projection by lengths of this vector and the proper angle will be because the scalar product is 
um, magnitude of this times magnitude of this times cosine of angle between them. So that would be basically my work, which is the same as this one. So this is the simple case. <coughs> and it's just elementary problem in mechanics. Whenever we were talking about dynamics in the part of mechanics of this course, even I, I, we can actually take a look at the lectures of uh, this particular course, that's where it's all explained. Okay, so the first case is simple. That's uniform vector field and straight line path. Now, just as an example, what if my force is perpendicular to my path? Well, then obviously this is equal to zero because I don't have to really re my my by my uh, uh, wind does not resist my movement against this particular uh, path. Now, if my uh, force is directed this way, it helps me. So uh, then, basically, I will have the n the, the negative uh, uh, negative scalar product. Um, well, it obviously depends on how we count the the angle. So the cosine of zero is equal to um, one, and the cosine of 180 is um, minus one. So it all depends. So the sign is kind of not as important right now, but the magnitude is definitely correct in this particular case. Plus or minus depends on whether I'm doing going from A to B or from B to A, and how I calculate the angle from um, from the vector to, uh, to from one vector to another or vi vice versa. So sine is basically not that important. In any case, this is basically the correct representation of the work which is supposed to be done either by me who is moving these um, uh, paper ships or by wind itself. So it depends on who I am actually, which side I'm, I'm representing. Okay, fine. So that's a simple case. Now, let's consider we have a different case. We still have a straight line movement, but our forces, our, our wind, it's not. So this is again from A to B but our forces are different and I still have to basically calculate um, work which either I'm supposed to do or the wind is doing whatever moving the paper ship from uh, one location on the surface of the lake to another. Okay, well how do we approach it? Well, first of all for simplicity I will use the system of coordinates. This is y and this is x. Doesn't really matter, I mean it's all up to me. I know my path from A to B, so I establish this particular type of coordinates. Now, in this coordinates every vector has some kind of magnitude and direction, okay? Now, again, obviously every vector can be represented as this type of thing. Now, as I'm moving from A to B, my Y coordinate is always zero, right? So, I don't really have to talk about any F of X, Y. I'm basically talking about F of X, zero. So, vectors which are at this particular point they are moving in some direction. So I'm interested to analyze these because all these are not important. I don't go through these points. I'm going only through these points and, that, and, and the wind in these points is important. Okay. So now this thing, this vector, each vector, again has two components. 
it has fx component and it has fy component obviously depending on coordinate x0 x0 okay so this is my x component from this vector for example this is my x component and this is my y component this is fx this is fy and again since fy is perpendicular to my path I don't care about it and I'm only involved with fx because only fx goes either helping me or resisting me right okay now how can I basically um, uh, calculate the work which is supposed to be um, done here. Well, I'm doing exactly the same as I've done with um, whenever we were approaching integration. If you remember, if you would like to have some kind of a area under the curve, we break the argument into small pieces, x0, x1, etc., xn, then we consider this to be almost like a rectangle with the height being equal to f of x ita, right? This is x i. And um, and then we will just multiply fxi times delta xi, and then we sum them together. And that would be, this is fx, f of xi, this is delta xi in between these. And then we will summarize them, and that would be the total uh, area. And then we will uh, go to a limit when the number of these points is increasing to infinity with each one shrinking to zero. That's exactly the same um, approach which we will take here. So there is nothing new here. What I will do here is I will break from, z uh, from A to B. This would be my x0, would be my xn, and I will break them into equal parts. Each one is equal to delta x. Let's say it's equal. doesn't really matter, but let's get, for simplicity consider it's equal. All right, so this is my xi, this is my xi plus 1, this is my xi minus 1, right? Now, at each interval from xa minus 1 to xi, I consider that the strength of the horizontal component of my wind is not really changing. Now, it's basically something which mathematicians are much more sensitive than physicists. Physicists always assume that something like a smoothness of anything which they're dealing with exists. Uh, mathematicians are more sensitive, they're basically asking, is it a smooth function or something like this? Smooth in terms of existing some kind of limits, um, etc. Et so we, we do assume, as physicists do, that um, we can uh, con consider the wind is not changing on this small infinitesimal, ultimately it will be infinitesimal um, segment. So during this particular um, piece of the pass, uh, wind is exactly the same. And it's equal to f of fx of um, x i comma zero. That's the horizontal component, the projection onto x axis of the vector x at point x i. So what we have to do is now we have this projection of the vector. <coughs> we can multiply it by delta x. So we have the distance, which is delta x. It's between x i minus 1 and x i. We have the strength of the force, which is this one. And then we will summarize it, i from 0, from 1 actually, from 1 to n, to get all the work done on each particular segment of our path. 
And then we will take the limit of when delta x goes to zero. That's the approach. And if I know this particular function, if my vector field is given as a function, and by the way, this is the function of one argument right now, right? It's a function of one argument of x. So basically, the result would be integral from a to b, from 0 to b, whatever, of function fx of x0 dx. So if my function fx is given, and it is given because my field, vector field is given, which means I know this at every point, x and y, so that's why I know projection onto x-axis, and I can take this integral. So the straight pass is fine. Now let's go to a curve pass, my third option. So I'm trying to do it like in a sequentially more difficult cases. Now, speaking mathematically, we are talking right now about introduction into integral along a curve, basically, which is very much similar to, um, to, to, to regular integral. But in any case, we, we just have to really spend some time. So we are talking about a non-uniform vector field, f of x, a, a, x, y, and we are talking about direction which is not really straight. This is A, this is B. Now how can I calculate this particular work? Okay. Now, I think it would be easier if my way from A to B is measured in time. Now my field remains the same with, within the time uh, frame. But my movement, so my position, is changing. So somehow, I actually have to have my position. My position is x, y. And I have to have my position specified as some kind of function of time. That's what defines the curve. Now, define the straight line. I define basically by a and b. And this is a straight line. So B has certain lengths, and basically that completely defines my, my pass. If pass is not straight, something like this, I have to define it somehow. So this is how I define it. So my, my position, let's call it R of T vector, has two components, my uh, abscissa coordinate as the function of time, and my position, uh, my ordinate position. So that's what defines my pass. OK. Now, I will do exactly the same thing as before, but instead of dividing a straight line into pieces, I define time into pieces. Let's say I'm at a at t is equal to 0, and I'm at b at t equals to some kind of a t. So I divide time segment from 0 to t into uh, uh, small segments from t0, which is 0, to t1, then from t1 to t2, etc., from t n minus 1 to t n, which is my end of time. And let's assume that I divide in such a way that delta t is constant. So difference in time between t2 and t1, same as dt from t3 to t from t to 3 to t to to 3 t3 etc so all the different intervals are, are are the same now what am i buying by doing this well now i have positions now this is position at t1 this is position at t2 this is position is ti this is position of ti minus 1 right now I'm making my delta t is so small that this particular segment of my curve is practically almost approximately straight. Now, if I'm talking about work, I have to 
have the force at this point and again assume that the force is the same during this period of time. So the force which is acting at this point is exactly the same as this and this and this. Again, mathematician would probably ask, okay, is that true that the function is smooth enough that whenever we are making small enough distance in time between these two positions, we can assume approximately that um, the wind will be basically the same along the same uh, straight line. So I'm basically reducing my macro problem into certain number of micro problem. Now every micro problem is exact, exactly like the first one which I was talking about when I have a, a uniform vector field and straight line uh, pass. So this is a straight line pass approximately and this is a uniform vector field approximately. So if I will multiply my lengths by projection now if this is let's say my force at this particular point so I'm representing it as perpendicular to this and parallel to this uh, segment obviously perpendicular is not involved at all so I have to find projection on the um, on the segment itself Okay, how, how can I characterize the, um, this particular segment? I need its direction and its length, right? Okay, fortunately enough, physics has its own approach. There is a concept of a speed. Now, speed, velocity, velocity is a speed and direction, so basically we're talking about velocity. So velocity of my um, uh, my movement at this point, well, and at this point we are assuming that delta t is small enough, is always a vector which is tangential to my segment itself. No matter how curvy my way is, velocity is always tangential to my, my curve. Again, if you remember, if you are moving along a circle, velocity is always tangential to a circle. So it doesn't really matter how you move. It's always, because velocity is actually uh, calculated based on position at this point, position at this point, and then you have a difference and you reduce the difference between this point and this point and uh, basically divide it um, by, by the length divided by time and that would give you uh, the, the tangential one. And velocity is as a vector is a, a derivative of position this is of x, y and this is of x, y. So at any point velocity is uh, a vector which is x of t, y of t. These are two, com r, x and y are two components of my r vector, but position vector, and their derivative, which is the prime, derivative is basically the vector of force. So that's what my velocity is, okay? So I have a vector which is definitely related to this segment, since it's tangential and the delta t is very small, so the points are very close to each other, and obviously the closer points are to each other, the closer the tangential line is to the segment between these two points. When this point is um, going to is moving towards this one, this segment is directed more and more as a tangential line. That's the definition of the tangent action, tangential line. Okay, so as you see, we do have some mathematics in this, so we need to understand these simple concepts. Okay, so what's the length of this segment? Hey, if I know the speed, 
and I know the time covered from one point to another. My length is V of x, y times delta t. Well, the length of this. That's my length of the segment. And direction is actually uh, the direction of the vector, of the vector V. So I know all the components I need. I need the <coughs> projection of my vector f onto the direction which is defined by v. So I need f of x, y. I have to multiply it as a scalar product by v of x, y. This is scalar product. And that scalar product will give me magnitude of this as projected onto this direction times magnitude of this, which is actually what I want. Magnitude of projection of f onto v times the length of uh, this particular vector. All I need is multiplied by delta t. Right? So delta t times v will give me the length. This times this will give me this and the projection. So I have my work. This is i's. Right? So I assume this is i, this is i, and this is i, and this is i. This is the piece of work which I am actually performing during this. What should I do then? Well, obviously I should summarize it. Which is actually, and go to a limit, when delta t goes to zero, right? When these points are closer and closer to each other which basically gives me integral <coughs> from 0 to t f of x, y uh, scalar product v of x, y dt or alternatively it can be expressed differently from 0 to t f of x, y dr of x, y. Well, dr obviously x, y. x of t, y of t. That's position. Or simply dr times f. That's how, in the simplest form, it actually expressed. So, this is basically a, not a simple integral, it's integral along a curve. But it's approached exactly the same as integral uh, of any regular functions. Well, why did I do all this? And why is it called circulation? Okay. Basically, this particular integral, the last one, it's called circulation from point A to point B. It's the definition, basically. What's more interesting is that there are certain vector fields when their circulation from A to B would be equal to circulation from A to B by any other path. So no matter how we move from A to B, the result, work which we have to really spend, will be the same. Now these fields are called conservative. For instance, um, gravitation field and electrostatic fields are um, possess this particular quality and they're called conservative. So. 
what's interesting is, and I'm not going to uh, to prove it right now, but maybe I will do it as as a problem la later on, that any conservative uh, field f of x y is actually a gradient a gradient um, of some scalar field. You remember what gradient is. That was a couple of lectures before. That's the operator oops. D F of X Y for D X D F of X Y for D Y vector. So if I have a scalar field which is function of two arguments basically there the partial derivative by first argument and partial derivative by second argument is a gradient. Physical sense, physical meaning of the um, of the gradient is which direction it it uh, changes the fastest. This these values. So it's a vector of fastest change. So uh, any conservative field is actually a gradient of some function which is called potential. Remember, gravitational potential, electric potential for electrostatic field. From these fields we can always get the force. <coughs> and again, maybe we'll just have a couple of problems later on solved in this particular case. Okay, now, if this is true, then what's interesting is that if I'm moving on any closed um, circuit, let's say, from A to A, uh, in the um, conservative field, my work, my my non, my, my um, um, circulation, should be equal to zero. Right? Why? Because I move, I, I'm just choosing any other point from here to here, supposed to be the same from here to here. But integral from here to here is opposite with a sign to move in an opposite direction because I'm moving in, in, in my, 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 my line, my all little pieces are in a different direction. So from here to here and then from here to here, which is the same as this one, but with an opposite sign, would give you a zero. So that's that. That's an interesting uh, fact, some, uh, just by itself. So if the field is conservative, then the circulation is equal to zero. Well, actually, because of this type of property, the name circulation comes, because we're always going around the circle. But in some cases, for some fields, it's not zero. And let's analyze these cases. So we are talking about something new. Now, imagine you have some kind of a field and, um, and you have to move around some kind of a closed path. Okay. That's some work, which is probably not equal to zero if the field is not conservative. But what is the relationship of the work which I'm spending here and the area of this inside this circle? We're talking about two-dimensional. Everything is in two-dimensional. So this is area. OK. What's interesting is that if I would like to know the um, circulation property in one particular point of the field, what I can do is I can surround this field with some path, have the circulation calculated, and have the area calculated. Now, obviously, if I'm squeezing, if my path is shrinking to the point, both my work is changing down, reducing probably to zero, 
and my area is reducing to zero. And what physicists have introduced, well, I'm not sure actually who introduced it. Um, they have introduced an interesting um, characteristic which is called curl. Curl is actually of the field f of x, y. This is a characteristic of the field at the point x, y. And it's a limit of circulation along a closed path divided by area when I am shrinking shrink my circle around it. Now when I'm saying circle it doesn't necessarily mean that it is circular. If the field is smooth enough and again this is mathematician is talking in me right now you still have to prove that this limit exists because maybe it depends on how exactly uh, the, the path is, is, is formed. Is it a circle? Is it a rectangle? Is it something else? Will this limit exist? And um, again, if it does exist, um, maybe uh, it would be different depending on what kind of a shape of the um, uh, circular path or, or any path or rectangular path or any closed path would be. So right now I'm completely leaving these issues out. The, these are relatively complex mathematical issues but we assume that the field is smooth enough so that this particular limit uh, indeed exists and now I will just go through the calculation of this limit, how it looks. And again, all we need for this from the mathematical standpoint a relative smoothness, well, differentiability, if you wish, um, of the field. So the field is supposed to be differential by x, by y, by whatever. Okay? But let's try to basically calculate this thing, assuming it exists. All right, what we do is we will choose a particular pass, a rectangular pass around my point this is my point, P of x, y, and I'm choosing the delta x here, delta y here, and I will squeeze these um, sides of this rectangle, so I will calculate my circulation around this particular um, path, and then I will uh, squeeze down to zero delta x and delta y and see what happens. Well, let's see what happens. If the middle point of this rectangle is x, y, then this point is um, x minus delta x, y minus delta y divided by 2, divided by 2, right? Half. But this is half of delta x. This point is x plus delta x divided by 2 uh, y minus delta y divided by 2, right? This is x plus delta x divided by 2 y plus y delta y divided by 2 and this one x minus delta x by 2 and y plus delta y by 2. <coughs> now, I assume that this is a very small um, rectangle, so the force within each uh, side of this rectangle, my force f of x, y, is the same and again that because my, my my force field is really smooth enough so whenever these points are close enough there is no change of the vector of force um, on this segment all right so let's just calculate the work which is required in this particular case my f of x is has two components fx and fy 
fx would be parallel, fy would be parallel to this, right? So whenever I'm moving along this side, I have to take into consideration only fx, because fy would be perpendicular. And whenever I'm moving along this side and this side, I'm taking into consideration only fy component. All right, so if I move from here to here, my component is equal to fx. Uh, let's take this one, for example. I'll take in the middle. That would be easier. Okay, so the component of this F fx component of this force at this point, this point has what coordinate of what? Um, x would be the same, and y would be minus delta uh, y divided by 2. x, y minus delta y divided by 2 times, and this length is delta x, right? Okay go this way. The component would be Fy of uh, this point has x plus delta x and y. x plus delta x over 2 y times delta y. Now this way. Now mind you, here we move from here to here and here we move in the opposite direction. So that would be with a minus sign. If I'm using the same component, it would be minus sign. So, minus sign would be what? So, plus, plus, minus, fx. <coughs> At this point, it's x, y plus, delta y over 2, times delta x, and again, minus, uh, here, and again I'm moving against delta y's that way, so I'm moving against, so it's minus sign, fy of um, x minus delta x over 2, y delta y. Okay, we've got our formula. Now it's simple. Remember this uh, Think from uh, calculus. Okay, so this is my A, this is my B. Now, the difference between, between them is this one, right? So if I take the line which is parallel at some point, C, then the difference between this and this would be equal basically to B minus A times tangent of this angle. And tangent of this angle is the uh, derivative at one middle point. <coughs> so whenever my points A and B are very close to each other, I can say that this is approximately times A mi uh, B minus A. But since points are very close to each other, I can put FB or FA, it doesn't really matter what it is. When A and B are very, very close. So basically, that's the definition of the derivative. So from this simple calculus case, we can combine this and this. What is this? Well, both of them are uh, delta x, and both of them are uh, fx, so it would be fx. Now, the first argument is the same, x. Second argument is um, y plus delta y divided by 2. No, the first is minus. Minus fx uh, x y plus delta y divided by 2. So. 
Now, and both are multiple by dx, delta x. Now, let me just talk about the y component. x component is fixed because right now where x is here and x is there. This is the difference between them. What's the difference is? Well, that's exactly the same as when I was talking about, about f uh, of b minus f of a. b is uh, this, a is this, and uh, it's equal to the difference between them, which is delta y, with a minus sign actually, times derivative, in this case partial derivative by y, in some middle point. But middle point between these two is y. So basically I can say that this is equal to fx of xy d by dy times the difference between arguments b minus y, b, b minus a, which is delta y, and delta x. But I think it's with a minus sign, right? Because this minus this would be equal to delta y minus delta y. All right, fine. Now, very similarly, if I will take uh, this and this, I will have d f y of x y by dx times delta x delta y. Exactly the same consideration. Because y and y is the same, and the difference between arguments is delta x. That's why I multiply by delta x and delta y itself. So, this difference between these two is my, sir, uh, my circulation. And I have to divide it by the area, right? divide by the area. Circulation divide by area. That's my curl definition. Area is delta x times delta y. So from this I came to a formula that circulation divided by area, when area is shrinking to a point x, y, is equal to d f y x y d x minus d f x d y because this is area which is cancelling when I divide the circulation by area so this is basically a final formula which we will return in the next lectures related to curl of the field. Curl is very important. For electromagnetic field, the Maxwell's equations related to electromagnetic field, they contain the curl. And that's basically why I have introduced the whole thing. This noble symbol with gradient and uh, 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 divergence and now we have the curl, and what's interesting is that the curl of this f of x, y of vector is equal to nabla vector product with vector f of x, y. Now, this will be explained later on, and that's what actually makes nabla very important symbol in physics. So you have, uh, you have gradient, you have divergence, and you have curl of the field expressed in Nabla. So now it's vector product, a cross product. Okay, that's it. I would suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. And as I said, that's, you go to unizor.com. Uh, the part is called Waves, and a particular topic is Field Waves which contains this lecture and others about gradient, about divergence, and about uh, Maxwell's equations. That's it. Thank you very much, and good luck.